Welcome to Capturing Christianity. My name is Cameron Bertuzzi. I'm exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief on my channel. Today I have Inspiring Philosophy, or uh, Michael Jones. I'm, I'm sure you're okay with me telling everyone your name these days. Uh, mm -hmm. But So I've got Michael Jones on with me. We're talking about the historical reliability of Genesis. Someone in the live chat was just asking, what part of Genesis are we talking about? Well, we're going to focus on Genesis 1 to 11. That's my that's the opening chapters. That's what most people think of when they think of Genesis, creation, flood, that kind of stuff. So, and that's my probably my favorite part of the Bible the more I think about it. Yeah, and so we have actually a whole well, not we, but you have prepared 132 slides, which is crazy. And people in the live chat were already saying that's a crazy amount of slides and it's not going to be, we're not going to spend like five minutes on every one. Some of them will go by really quickly, but he does have uh, Michael has a lot prepared for, for this uh, today. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. Michael, is there, would you like to say anything as sort of an introduction for anyone who doesn't know who you are? Why don't we do that first and then we'll just jump right over to the slides. Yeah. So I run inspiring philosophy, another YouTube channel. I build a lot of animated graphical videos to defend Christianity Genesis is one of my favorite areas of interest. I'm currently going through a series on exegesis and studying what Genesis is saying. But as like a side quest, I've also been collecting data to argue for the reliability of Genesis. And this has been something I've been working on for a couple years now. Yeah, I like uh, the language of, of side quest. Well, uh, okay, well, go ahead and pull up your slides here and we'll get okay. started. And if I All have right, questions so and stuff, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll slow you down or whatever. Um, also, let me mention this as we start to get going here. Uh, okay, so, sorry, I saw someone in the live chat saying that they were having trouble hearing, but it looks like no one else is saying saying that, so it looks like uh, all the sound and everything is good. Okay, um, so I want, to, I want to say this before we get started. So we're going to do some Q&A at the end of this. So you have questions that pop up in your mind as Michael is talking, then write them down on like a notepad or in your mind, but don't put them in the live chat yet. I'll be asking for that at the very end. So just hang out until then. If you want to send a question as a super chat, that is extremely easy for me to go back and find and, and check and put up on the screen. So if you uh, if you want to make sure that one of your questions is asked today, that's the way to do it. But I'll share more information about asking questions as we get closer to that time. Go ahead, Michael. All right, so let's get started. This is the reliability of Genesis 1 to 11. I'm going to divide this into four basic parts, internal evidence, external evidence, later biblical references, what? Mainly from Old Testament, and then internal consistency. Now, as you sorry, know, as I, I, noticed, I, I was uh, you you had this thing up, and I we we couldn't see the last one on on my screen here, so I just moved our our stuff over to this our, our little video feed over to the side here. So okay, that's why. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go so ahead. Then there we go. So yeah, then we have internal consistency. Now, what I'll say is what I get from what a lot of skeptics is when I start going through this data is they'll take one piece of the data and go, well. That doesn't really amount to much. Yeah. Uh, individually, all these pieces I'm going to go over are not going to amount to much. My argument is that collectively, together, they make sort of like a big punch. It'd be It's one thing if I'm throwing pebbles at you. It's not going to do much. If I have like a pebble gun and I shoot like 50 at you at once, it's going to have some effect. Likewise, these all work together to argue that Genesis is old, reliable, goes back to a very ancient time, and it is internally consistent, so it probably wasn't uh, – this sort of documentary hypothesis, which we'll get into later. So to start with internal evidence. I'm going to start working from Genesis 10 and work back to Genesis 1 and then work back up from Genesis 1 to 11 in external evidence. So internal evidence. The first thing I want to cover is the table of nations in Genesis 10. We all know the table of nations. It's the part you don't read. You skip over that because that's boring. But if you actually get into some of the details here, there's a little bit of interesting data within the table of nations, which argues that it probably dates to early Bronze Age, or middle or even middle bronze age i'm talking the time of abraham even so first thing to note is it lacks mentions of israel's later neighbors like the moabites the ammonites the edom the, the, the like edom these were important for israel in the first millennia bc if you're going to do a survey of the surrounding nations you'd think you would include these groups as well another interesting point is that in the table of nations sidon is listed to represent uh, the phoenicians now, this is interesting because Sidon was more of like the primary city for them in the second millennium BC, whereas in the first millennium, Tyre sort of becomes a more prominent city, and Tyre is missing in there. It mentions the cities of the plains, Sodom and Gomorrah, 
Now, based on archaeological evidence, which I'm, I won't cover here, but I'll do it in a video later in about a year or so, uh, they pro Sodom and Gomorrah was, could not have existed after 1600 BC. And so why would you mention these cities that were destroyed uh, if, you know, if they're in, as part of your survey? It seems kind of an odd thing to place them in there. Now, they could have been maybe in the late Bronze Age, the, the destruction, the site was still known. So that's a possibility. But by the time of the Iron Age, it's very unlikely you're going to have to mention them. And that's why we don't really see them that mentioned much in later surveys. Uh, it affiliates the Philistines with this area called Kalahum, or Kal's Lahum, instead of what later authors attribute their origin to. And so someone like D.I. Block suggests this might reflect an earlier memory of their origins. They were associated more with like the Sea People. So they may have had a, some sort of other place they came from before they were associated with this later part mentioned in Jeremiah. It highlights Eber as the ancestor of the Hebrews. Now, by the time we get to the time of the monarchy, that's more or less attributed to Abraham. Everyone looks to Abraham. But Abraham, of course, wouldn't attribute himself as the uh, ancestor of the Hebrews because, you know, he wasn't. He, he would have been part of a, a group of people. So it highlights Eber as the ancestor of the Hebrews. That's something we don't see later on during the later works of the Bible. Another minor point, it mentions the Medes as a more prominent people group instead of calling them like the Persians and the Medes, uh, which we would have, you would expect later given the Persian Empire. Now that could be consistent with a very early Iron Age, but it also fits with Bronze Age ideas. Uh, the name Elisha is found in cuneiform documents to go back to the 18th century at, at Alaka, and is affiliated with the name which we see of, of Javan in the Ras Shum, Shumra text. Uh, descendants of Canaan are also mentioned in early texts. You can see the work of D.I. Block or uh, D.J. Or DJ Wiseman there. So there's a lot of e really interesting correlations in the table of nations. So Wiseman says this, It would not be unreasonable to assume that the information in this chapter could therefore be known to Abraham himself. It is becoming increasingly clear that the geographical information of Genesis 10 could have been available to the Egyptian court when Moses received his education there in the 15th or 14th century BC. So it seems to fit this time period, not a time period we would see with a later monarchy. Uh, the survey would have been useless to them now because things like the city of the plains would have been out of existence. They would have to have a more updated survey. Uh, so the next piece I want to cover is moving down now into Genesis 8. An interesting piece of data is that Noah opens the window and he sends forth a raven first and then a dove and the dove again. People have highlighted this in a, for a lot of ways because they'll note it's similar to what we see in Gilgamesh. Uh, Gilgamesh, the G Gilgamesh here uh, uh, also releases birds, but he does it in a different order. For him, it's the dove, the swallow, and the raven. And people have debated about, well, what's with the order? Is there something special about the order? Now, building on scholars, I would argue that the Genesis account is more practical from a, a, a sea navigating perspective, or for someone who's being at sea, the Gilgamesh order is not that practical. So I'll just quote from them directly. This is in the IVP Bible background commentary. Unlike pigeons or doves, which will return after being released, a raven's use to the seaman is based on its line of flight. By noting the direction it chooses, a sailor may determine where the land is located. The most sensible strategy is to release a raven first and then use other birds to determine the depth of water and the likelihood of a place to land. So, just take it from let's take no out of the equation for a second. You're at sea and you're lost at sea. All you see is water. You have birds. The first thing you want to do is determine where land is. So you release a raven. A raven can fly longer. It can live off things it can find in the ocean because you know it can eat you know rotting meat and whatnot. Uh, the raven will tell you which direction to fly in. It's going to go towards land ultimately. So you release the raven first, and you start going in that direction. As you get closer to land, you then release a dove or a pigeon of some sort. By doing that, they don't want to fly that much. They don't want to fly long. They want to return. They can't live off you know, ocean. They have to eat plants. It will return to you if it can't make it to land. So it will tell you how far you are away to land. Now let's remember what Noah does. He releases the raven first. Genesis 8, 5 says he tops of the mountains were seen. So take it from Noah's perspective. He's not trying to navigate. He's just in an ark waiting for the waters to go down. He sees mountains all around him. Well, how does he know which mountains are the closest? Well, he doesn't. He releases a raven, and he can see where the raven is going. That's going to help him determine where the lowest point, where the land will first appear. 
Then he releases a dove. The, the dove is not going to fly far like the raven does. Remember, it says the raven flow to and fro from the earth until the waters are dried. The dove is going to returns to him because it doesn't. Its land is still too far away. He releases a dove a set, you know, a week later or so, and it, it returns with an olive leaf. That tells him the waters receded to a point that where land is starting to appear for even doves to make it. So the Genesis approach seems like a more realistic approach for surveying the land and the water receding back. It just seems to make more sense than what Gilgamesh does, or the hero in Gilgamesh, to release a dove, a swallow, and a raven. Another interesting aspect about these early flood myths is, you know, they'll say that, you know, Genesis was just plagiarized by Gilgamesh. Well, Kenneth Kitchen notes, that would be really weird. He says Genesis 6 to 8 was probably the simplest and the shortest of all the ancient versions, possibly origi- originating as early as they, and was certainly not a secondary elaboration on them. And he draws attention to the lines. The Atrahasis, Atrahas is another flood epic, but it's much longer than the flood. But he's talking about the flood account within the Atrahasis, as well as Eridu Genesis. He looks at all the flood accounts, and he says, if you look at Genesis, it seems to be the simplest. Uh, the only closest one is Eridu Genesis in that sense. Genesis seems like a far simpler tradition, a lot of, not a lot of elaboration packed on it. So if they're plagiarizing Gilgamesh, they, uh, they would have to sort of cut things back and whatnot. Now, we'll come back to this later uh, when we get to a little bit of um, uh, more internal evidence, but we'll come back to the flood epic a little bit later. Now, I want to note something else about Genesis. They'll say that it was written late. A lot of very, very liberal scholars will say that Genesis was written 3rd century BC, I've heard. You know, this is after the exile. I've heard Babylonian exiles typically where some people want to place it. Now, that doesn't seem to match what we see at works around that time that have a lot of Aramaic cognates. Genesis seems to have a fair amount of Akkadian cognates. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about the word for mist in Genesis 2.6. There's a mist coming up to water Eden, and that's been connected to an Akkadian cognate. Uh, there's been some other ones as well, like garden might possibly also be another one that connects to a Sumerian and an Akkadian word. Uh, there's another guy that, who's argued that there's an Akkadian cognate in Genesis 4.1 for bringing forth Cain. Interesting thing about the, the cities in Genesis 4 is the two sons' names, Enoch and Arad, they seem to be connected to the cities Urek and Eridu. In Sumerian, uh, as Wiseman notes, the way you would pronounce Urek is uh, Unak, U-N-U-K. Or, so it sounds a little bit more similar to Enoch in that sense. Uh, in Genesis 6.14, there are three Akkadian cognates in there. Uh, I would argue that might be one of the earliest verses of the whole Bible, um, up there with like passages like Exodus 15, for example. Uh, there seems to be a lot of Akkadian cognates that are sort of sprinkled in throughout Genesis 1-11. But you know, Akkadian wasn't really used much in the later um, period during the Babylonian exile. It was a, it was a, a language used much more during the Bronze Age. So it seems to reflect that kind of time period. The sort of these sort of Akkadian cognates are popping in and out of there. Uh, now, to be fair, there might also be some Aramaic cognates as well, and I think that would possibly reflect the idea that when you translate Genesis into the later Chaldean alphabet, you're going to get some of that. But you're not going to get something like what you see in like Enoch or Jubilees, where there are mostly just Aramaic cognates in there. There was no evidence of very early Akkadian cognates in that sense. So early words seem to put it more also from stemming from an older tradition in that sense. Uh, names of Genesis 1 to 11 also seem to match very early periods. Uh, this is something Richard Hess brings up in his book, Israelite Religions. He draws examples to uh, names like Mesushael, and Tubal Cain, which might refer to the Hurrian word for smith. Again, he also highlights the connections to Uruk and Eridu. Another interesting connection is the name Adam. Uh, so in the, the book I keep mentioning, I study the descriptions before the flood, Adam might also appear in an Assyrian king list very early on, Adamu or Ata- Atuma in the genealogy of the Hammurabi dynasties. Uh, it also could be connected to a god in the Elba tablets, perhaps some sort of deified uh, you could, from a biblical perspective, we'd say it'd be like a deified human in that sense. But it seems to have possibly have been coming from an early name in that sense. So moving on, I want to talk a little bit about Genesis 5 here. Now, I covered this a lot in one of my videos, but a lot of people have talked about the ages here and how they kind of line up. Most of them are divisible by 5. Uh, the rest become divisible by 5 by subtracting 7s. 
Uh, and so Kenton Sparks notes the the eight all, the, the the probability of all these ages coincidentally ending in a zero, two, five, seven, or nine is extremely improbable. These things just don't sort of happen. Uh, and so these seem to be idealized formulas. Now a lot of young Earth creationists get mad at me for that. But if you start to look at this, this could actually support the idea of Genesis is also an older text. So let's go on. Uh, what we see in the later parts of Genesis is we don't see these same formulas. We see different formulas of idealization with the ages of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Israel. Uh, so still idealized numbers, but in a different ma manner. Same with Joseph. Joseph is given the age of 110. That's the perfect age in Egyptian mythology. Uh, the stillae of Emin, see the stille of Amenhotep III, for example. Now, later, when we get to the kings, there are no idealized formulas. Uh, every every number here, there's a, every number is here. So everything ends in one of the decimals from zero to nine. There are no idealized ages here. There's no formulas. So let's put this together. What we possibly see happening, and I think this is likely in Genesis 5 and 11 as well, possibly, is that you're seeing a base 60 system. This is how the uh, ancient Akkadians, Sumerians counted. You, they have five fingers, and you can see of the four fingers, there are 12 segments. So they did 12 segments times five fingers, you get 60. Don't ask me why they didn't include the thumb. I don't know. I wasn't there. But they counted a, Now, we have a base 10 system. We count one, we have 10 fingers, count one to 10. They had a base 60. That's where we get, you know, 360 degrees in a circle or 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, that kind of thing. It goes back to the base 60 system. Instead of multiples of 10, you have multiples of 60. Now, Genesis 1 to 11 seems to be utilizing a base 60 system. Genesis 12, to the book of Samuel, we see a lot of idealized numbers, which is similar to what we see in uh, texts from Canaan as well as Egypt. Then after, we see mostly literal number usages, and I would argue this would reflect different authorships for the different sections. You see that you have some authors have compiled it using a base 60 system. Later authors are updating the history they're adding, and they're using a different sort of system of numbers. And then by the time they're doing Kings and Chronicles, they're just using literal numbers at that point. So it seems to reflect different authorships and could reflect different time periods in that sense. So moving on, um, a lot of people have argued if the movement – now, some people, skeptics, will say that Genesis was sort of just uh, plagiarized from these polytheistic myths during the Babylonian exile. So when the Jews were in exile, they uh, took things like the Atrahasis or Gilgamesh, and they just took the parts they liked, and they made a monotheistic version of them all. And – but, you know – uh, James Hoffmeyer responds to this by saying that just seems improbable. If the movement towards monotheism occurred during the Babylonian captivity, it seems counterintuitive to take the polytheistic mythic literature of Babylon and place it into the Hebrew monotheistic writings. In other words, if you're becoming a monotheist or you're advocating strict monotheism, why would you use polytheistic texts when you're, that's supposed to be utter heresy? That's detestable to God. You, that just doesn't seem likely. So the reason I bring this up is because some people will say Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 is a plagiar is plagiarized from the Sumerian king list. Well, see, they use a base 60 system as well for their kings. Genesis uses a base 60 system. Well, the, it's probably just plagiarized from the king list. I've even heard young earth creationists tell me this, that the king lists are the same as the Genesis genealogies. That's probably not likely. I, don't, I would not argue that Genesis is plagiarizing the king lists. In Sumerian mythology. The reason is, is Richard Hess has written a paper on this, and he knows there are too many differences. The genealogies of the ancient Near East are connected with succession of office holders, like a priest or a king. This is not the case in Genesis. It's about transforming sons, carrying on a bloodline, going back to Adam, up to Abraham. That's what their aim is. The aim of the king's list is to give a descendant figure a certain royal or official status. That's really not what Genesis is doing. It's not trying to show that Abraham should be king. The king lists do not include ages at which the next king was begotten. So in Genesis, you see, you know, like at this age, this son was begotten. This is when Jared had his son, and this is when Methuselah had his son, so on and so on. Uh, that's not in the king list, in Sumerian king list. It's another formal contrast there. Uh, the king list in Genesis seem to be working in opposite directions. And so what Hess means by this next point is basically is that the king lists are talking about an idealized time in the past. Genesis really is not doing that. If you get into the scholarship, it's really not. What they're trying to do is they want to move the timeline forward. 
They're trying to build up to Abraham. That's the biggest point about Genesis 1 to 11. We got to get to Abraham. The kingless are not working towards that same type of goal. And finally, the most interesting thing is there is no table of nations in kingless. The table of nations is without without parallel in the ancient Near East. It's really sort of distinct in terms of in terms of what the Hebrews sort of put out. You know, they're the only ones who did this massive survey of the nations around them at the time. So what we see, though, is just because the kingless in Genesis both use the same sort of base 60 counting system, it doesn't mean one plagiarized the other. It just is a cultural similarity that reflects the same cultural time period is what I would argue. But it doesn't mean one plagiarized the other. There are too many formal contrasts to suggest that. So let's move on. I also want to just briefly talk about this. Some say the occupations of Genesis 4, like metalworking, they are they have to be anachronistic because we don't have metalworking uh, until, you know, like – early Bronze Age and whatnot. Well, that's not true. We can see metalworking going back almost to the 10th millennium BC, uh, and same with agriculture as well. So Adam Gardner, Kane Gardner, that kind of stuff, it goes back pretty far. We don't have to say that these are anachronistic accounts of, the, of uh, different occupations. So I want to talk about snakes now. There's a big theme in Genesis 3, if you haven't heard about a snake. Uh, this is a a big attacking point for atheists is they'll say, oh, the Bible promotes talking snakes, and we just roll our eyes and you know go on with our day because you know it's a bad argument. But I'm going to give you reasons, specific, really good reasons as to why it's a bad argument. Snakes in Egyptian Canaanite mythology are otherworldly as well. You have regular snakes, and then you have otherworldly snakes. So in Egypt, there, for example, is a the great serpent god who is in the desert mountains. Uh, Lord of fear in the netherworlds, the many face one in the place of silence. So there seems to be this idea of otherworldly snakes. Now, I also want to talk about the word for seraph, seraphim, that we see. So think of Isaiah 6. God is surrounded by the seraphim when Isaiah has this great vision of, of God up on his throne and whatnot. Now, interestingly enough, seraph is another run of the word mill for like a poisonous or a fiery serpent. It's not just a word for an angelic being. It's also a word for serpent. And you could basically see it probably actually comes from the Egyptian word. So Trigvay Meninger notes there is now an emerging consensus that the Egyptian Uriah serpent is the original source of the seraphim motif. So the, uh, the word seraph, seraphim, probably came from an Egyptian word. Interesting kind of parallel there. Things get a little more interesting. These are seals from... Uh, Israel around the 8th century to about the exile they found throughout in that time period. And they're depicting seraph, seraphim. As you can see, they're winged serpents. One interesting seal, this is a side quest here shortly. Uh, Benjamin Somers notes this is seal 273 and it portrays Yahweh symbolically as a sun disc wearing a crown. Uh, the text on the seal states that it belonged to a courtier of King Ahaz named Ashna. In light of the similarities between the seal and Isaiah 6, it is worth noting that Jerusalem in the 8th century BCE was a very small town, and that both Isaiah and Ashna lived during the reign of King Ahaz, and that Isaiah enjoyed very close connections to the royal court in which Ashna served. Consequently, it is inconceivable that Isaiah and Ashna did not know each other. So Samer argues that this could be the first depiction of Isaiah's vision from Isaiah 6, dating to that time period, basically. So you might actually see someone trying to depict what Isaiah had in a vision here. That's a possibility. Okay, so given that the word seraphim uh, comes from an Egyptian word for snake, uh, given the iconography, what Isaiah saw in his vision of Isaiah 6 was probably winged serpents, this kind of idea, these otherworldly snakes. Now think about Genesis 3. Was it a talking snake? Yes and no. It was a talking snake, but it wasn't a gardener, gardener snake or a king cobra. It was an otherworldly serpentine being. Things get even more interesting when we look at these ancient Egyptian texts. From These are old pyramid texts. So this goes back before Abraham, the, the, uh, um, the early um, – what is it? It's the old kingdom of Egypt, very far back. Now, the Egyptian pyramid texts, they are, uh, they're, uh, basically they're created to help the pharaoh on his journey through the afterlife. And in these texts, as you can see right here in the middle, there's a serpent there. They warn of these serpents of the underworld that will attempt to thwart the pharaoh on his journey. So 
He's going through the underworld. These serpents are kind of going to try to lead him off the path and into chaos. Now, what's interesting is that there are some parallels to how they talk about the serpent in Genesis 3. It's, the God says he's going to crawl on his belly. Seems a parallel Egyptian, uh, early Egyptian pyramid text telling what the telling what the Pharaoh to do. So when the Pharaoh is on his way to on the on the road through the underworld to the afterlife, if he encounters these serpents, he is to tell them to lie down, to glide away, to fall, glide down, beast lie down. Similar to how what sort of how God responds to the serpent in Genesis three, you know, get on your belly kind of thing. Same with eat dust. It's not telling the serpent what he's going to eat, it's telling him, you know, let your poison glands be in the ground, spittle into the dust. That's also paralleled in these different allusions in the pyramid text, how to handle these otherworldly serpents. Get them on their belly, get them in the dust kind of thing. So there seems to be far more interesting connections there. Now that would be available, obviously, to Moses, who would have been serving in you know the court there at that time period. You know, and it's I'm not saying he sort of just copied it. I'm saying there there were similar the theological themes between the Egyptians and the Israelites in terms of the existence of these otherworldly serpents and how you're supposed to deal with them. You put them on their belly, make them eat dust, kind of thing. Now, a very another short little piece of interesting da data is that Arabia, modern day Arabia, had an earlier name called Havilah. We know when the switch happened in the Bible. In Genesis, it's called Havilah. And then in later texts, it's called Arabia. So Genesis seems to fit with an earlier name for the area. And interestingly enough, if you look in the Bible when the switch happened, it happens around the same time the Queen of Sheba comes up to meet Solomon. So all of a sudden, Solomon is making new trade connections, and they start calling it by a new name, Arabia. So there's an interesting little connection there, but Genesis seems to identify the area by its old name, fitting yet again with another earlier time period. Last thing I think I want to talk about internal evidence is parallels to other creation myths. So the structure of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is a dependent clause, circumstantial clause, main clause. This is how you grammatically would sort of open these kind of accounts. See the same thing in the Enuma Elish and the Asherhasis. Dependent clause, circumstantial clause, main clause. This is grammatically how you would open a creation account. Now again, I'm not saying they were borrowing from the new Elish or the Atrahasis. I'm saying this is a similar cultural theme. It's like if you're going to uh, start a, a, uh, you know, a republic, a dem democratic republic government, you start with a constitution. We see that with like, you know, the, uh, the American Revolution and the French Revolution. And they weren't really borrowing from each other, which is a similar cultural theme to have these similar cultural ideas. So Genesis also seems to follow the same pattern we see in Atrahasis. Creation, population increase, prelude to the flood, then the flood, and then a new start. Same, just sort of building themes and blocks. If you get into like little details, in the prelude to the flood, there's some parallels there. God says his day shall be 120 years. And the prelude to the flood of the Atrahasis, it mentions 12,000 years had gone by. So there's another idealized number in there. It talks about the sons of God in Genesis 6-2. In Eridu Genesis, it says this is when the royal scepter was coming down from heaven. So it seems to be a little bit of a parallel there in accounts of how things happened in the past. And when people say, you know, the flood with them was a myth, I don't think that's fair given the archaeological data we'll go over in a little bit. But the Sumerians were so sure a flood happened, they inserted it into their king list. Uh, that's, they're, they're pretty much saying this is history. So there was this idea there was a flood in the past is pretty much confirmed uh, by the different groups in that area. Now, scholarly dates for these eptics. These are debatable. I'm just r providing rough estimates. I think Eridu Genesis is actually, I'm more convinced it's actually around 1600 BC, but I'm trying to be fair by putting it a little further back. But I think it probably came about the same time as the Atrahasis, honestly. And Numa Elish, some put it back as far as 1600 BC. Some say it's Neo Babylonian. But then Genesis seems to have to be around 500 BC. Now, my, my basic argument is, is that if it's Using the same sort of cultural themes, why could it not be dated a little bit later? My, honestly, I would put Genesis during the, the monarchy of Solomon, or David maybe, because I think that would – given themes that come in Genesis 12 and after, I think it better fits with that time period. Uh, but I think that would be the most uh, – that when we first see the, uh, the a, resemble, a resemblance of what we have in our Genesis is during the days of Solomon – uh, or David when they were sort of trying to establish their history like these other cultures they had.
for example, there seems to be relations with the Assyrians because uh, there's a tablet called Assyrian Car 4, which I have listed here, which is an, sort of like another sort of Assyrian version of the Enuma Elish. It shows sort of cultural relations going on there. And it sort of fits with the idea that cultures were sort of putting their history together and sort of collecting these ideas and trying to establish what where they came from, uh, what their ideas were in that sense. So if Genesis fits grammatically and structurally with these earlier works, it doesn't seem inconceivable to push it back a little further. So again, as I, I quoted Hoffmeyer earlier, but I'm just reminding people, it just doesn't seem likely that they would sort of be putting this history together to sort of plagiarize polytheistic myths during the Babylonian exile. I would say a lot of this data and this 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 argument from a priori basically is that if you're going to be in exile and you're supposed to be becoming monotheistic during this time period, why are you plagiarizing these polytheistic myths? You would probably want to reflect your own history and whatnot and collect that and get that kind of idea together instead of stealing from the people you are claiming are heretics and evil and are preaching false religions. It doesn't seem to make much sense there. Now. In connection with all this, this idea that Genesis 1 to 11 could date to late Bronze Age, Richard Hess brings up some very interesting correlations. He notes that pagan cultures, Israel was aware of pagan cultures and their customs and writings. Hess looks specifically at Levitical rituals and festivals and seasons and finds striking correlations to the city of Emmer. Now, Emmer's festivals were late Bronze Age events, around 1500 BC to about 1200 BC. In this light, Levitical feasts and rituals can be seen as cultic competition. Both cult, uh, cultural texts have doublet, doublet natures in that sense. And what uh, he argues that Israel is doing is they're about to move into the Promised Land. And if you read you know, Deuteronomy and whatnot, uh, they're very concerned that Israel is going to start chasing after pagan idols and participating in pagan festivals and doing all these horrible pagan things. So it makes sense for them to structure their own festivals as sort of like to compete. You can't go participate in a pagan festival on this date because it's you know it's the Feast of Booths or it's Passover. You have your own festivals you have to do. So they seem to be aware of festivals that were present in Canaan from the city of Amr, which were which was quite influential, and they're matching their festivals on dates that match the city of Amr, sort of like his cultic competition, saying, look, if you're going to have your festival on, on these days, we're going to do the same thing. And in that sense – the Israelites will not be tempted to go particip participate in these other festivals. Now, the Levitical festivals make sense with the festivals we see at Emmer. They don't make sense with later pagan festivals you would see uh, during the Syrian ages or later during the Persian period or even later you know, in the Babylonian exile period. They fit more with this late Bronze Age idea. Uh, arguing from that implicitly, we could suggest that Genesis 1 to 11 could also be cultic competition with like other uh, pagan myths. Oh, you've put together your history? Well, we have our other ha history as well, and we're just going to put it out there so that you know our people won't be tempted to believe your history kind of attitude. That kind of similarities. It doesn't say it's false. It just sort of is following the same sort of idea that this is when cultures were sort of putting their history together, that kind of sense. So this same kind of interest I just kind of made there. Now, on back to the idea that, well, they were just plagiarizing the Atrahasis. Or they were just plagiarizing Gilgamesh. Jean Batero says, though the more though the more than substantial identity with the Babylonian flood is not in not, not is not in the least doubt, there are too many divergent details between the two for the account of Genesis to be regarded simply as a transcript into Hebrew of the Akkadian text of Atrahasis or Gilgamesh. In other words, if you get into the details of these two, they, yeah, they both they all mention a flood. But there are so many divergent details. You can't say one is just copying the other. And that's what Patero tries to point out here. Similarly, David Toshio Samuru talks about Genesis 1 and Enuma Elish. And he says, uh, Genesis 1 and Enuma Elish, which was composed primarily to exalt Marduk in the pantheon of Babylon, have no direct relation to each other. It is not correct to say that Enuma Elish was adopted and adapted by the Israelites to produce the Genesis stories. As Lambert holds, there is no evidence of Hebrew borrowing from Babylon. So the data that we have about the similarities between Genesis and these other accounts does not suggest borrowing. It suggests competition. You're laying down your history. We're going to lay down our history as well. Same kind of cultural themes that are happening there. Now, last thing I want to note is there's a very interesting hymn here. Mankind is well cared for, the, li the livestock of God. 
He made the sky for their sake. He subdued the water monster. He made breath for their nostrils to live. They are his images who came from his body. He rises to the heaven for their sakes. He made them plants and cattle, birds and fish to feed them. He slew his foes, reduced his children when they thought to rebel. Might be a reference to a flood there. Who knows? He makes daylight for their sake. He sails by them to sea. He has built his shrine around them. When he weeps, he when they weep, he hears. Now, it almost sounds like a psalm talking about Genesis. You know, it seems almost it references similar ideas like, you know, humans are his image. He made the birds and the fish, you know, made the heavens and the sky. But actually, this is from an Egyptian text, the instruction of Merikere. So some have suggested what we see in Genesis 1 has to reflect a later time period. However, very similar themes are seen in Egypt very early on. I'm talking you know, back to like the Middle Bronze Age and before. So this idea of Genesis 1 has to reflect late theology. I don't think it's very fair. We can see the same or very similar ideas in early Egyptian texts as well. So Genesis could conceivably not – it's not definitive, but it, it could date to Bronze Age time. So let's move on to external evidence. We've covered a lot of internal evidence, but people want to talk about the external evidence. So we're going to cover four things, the land of Eden, the flood, Nimrod, and the Tower of Babel. Now, I did a very lengthy video on Eden, so I'll cover this briefly for those who haven't seen the video. Okay, Eden mentions one river that flowed into four. Two of them are the Tigris and the Euphrates. One flowed into Arabia. One flowed into Ethiopia. So if you were to sort of make something, it would have to look like this. It doesn't that doesn't fit any geology out there. However, Genesis 2 is a little ambiguous. Headwaters can also refer to like can also refer to like the end of poles, and Genesis 2 can actually mean that four rivers flowed into one. See the book I studied the inscriptions from before the flood which covers that in more detail. Now, the world over 8,000 years ago was a little bit different. This was before the end of the last ice age, and as you can see, there was a lot more land. Look at Australia or look at Florida. A lot more land there. So you can see this is Japan, uh, China, a lot more connected. And as you can see, Korea is connected right to China. Uh, this is Indonesia area, a lot more land down there. And this is the Middle East. Notice the Persian Gulf is missing. Well, this is basically what the Middle East would have looked like, uh, thanks to Sentinel Apologetics for this uh, graphic here. So you can see the Tigris and Euphrates flowed into one river that flowed through the uh, Gulf at that time was a paper on this, and they called it the Gulf Oasis. The Persian Gulf used to be the Gulf Oasis. And what he notes is that in this Gulf Oasis, there was an abundance of food, lithic raw material, water. It's a sizable inland depression. The area received very little rainfall. It had a rich mosaic of freshwater springs to water the vegetation there. And it had a very controlled climate, around 70 degrees year-round. Basically, it was an oasis. It was a paradise, an Eden. Uh, here's a map of what he sort of uh, shows. As you can see, there are additional rivers that sort of flowed in there. And probably what we have here is we have the Wadi Batin River, which is probably the Pishon River, flowing into Arabia or Havilah. And then you have the Gihon River, which flowed into the land of the Kaziites. So instead of it flowing into Kush, it could be a, uh, a, a name for Kashu, as Kenneth Kitchen argues. Uh, it could actually be in, um, arguing that it wasn't Kush, it was Kas. So it's a possibility there, but Eden seems to very well fit with this sort of inland depression that later became the Gulf and was, hint, hint, flooded. So let's move on to the flood, speaking of that. Uh, what happened to the Gulf Oasis? Well, in this paper, you'll note that he, Jeffrey Rose argues that it gradually flooded over thousands of years. And this was the consensus for a while, that this is being challenged now. A recent paper argued that the that this inland depression uh, had suffered a catastrophic flood about 13,000 to 8,500 years ago. So as you can see, this is uh, based on the, the area, inland area. A lot of the waters would have created the deluge in the mountainous regions, that's the red areas, and then it would have flowed into the green regions, creating a mega lake. However, uh, Muhammad al Bastawazi notes this mega lake that formed, it was insufficient to drain the water. And so a mega lake would have formed there for you know, a short time period. So he talks about how this would have happened catastrophically and suddenly, filling in the area, causing a flood, and then a mega lake to form for a, a short period of time. And so he concludes by saying the early Holocene period in Arabia has drastically reshaped the fluvial systems 
groundwater, and indeed the early human civilization. So interesting thing there, there, there was an area called Eden, and it really was flooded. Uh, so you can see kind of here, this would be possibly the, the, mo the furthest extent of the flood kind of idea. Also around this time, we do see a little bit about how uh, there was a sharp decrease in the male population, was a disparity of one male for every 17 females. Now, this might also fit with what Genesis 6 to 11 says, that the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. As we know, as you know, men are the, in the ancient times were more likely the ones to go to war and fight, and you know, take care of that kind of stuff. And the uh, the uh, geo, uh, our genetical genetic record seems to reflect that idea. There was a uh, bottleneck of man, of man at that time. And it could also fit with what we see in the Table of Nations that several cultures could trace their lines back to just a few men several thousand years ago. So there's some interesting parallels there. That doesn't prove this, but it shows that these things are lining up. Now, what about Nimrod? Let's move on to the next one. Who was this Nimrod? Okay, I'm going to point out he wasn't this Alexander Hislop fable. He wasn't this. He wasn't married to Semiramis or anything. That's all made up in the 1800s. Don't believe the crazies online who say that stuff about him. A more scholarly approach to Nimrod is what I'll give you here. Nimrod basically means to rebel. It comes from that root word there, and this comes from Douglas Petrovich. So the court, it's sort of like a slang term. It's like saying that rebellious one. It may not be his actual name. It might just mean a, be a slang term for him. So it's a bad nickname in that sense. So what do we know about him? Well, he was a descendant from Cush. He was called a mighty man. He was a hunter or a slaughterer. Starts in the land of Sumer, which is Shinar in the Bible, and conquers the region of Assyria. Now this fits with someone particularly. It fits with a guy called Sargon of Akkad. He descended from a city called Kish. He became a powerful emperor. Lugal, Sumerian word for king, means big man. So could reflect the mighty man in, in Genesis 10. Killed many to build his empire and starts in the land of Sumer and then conquers the region of Assyria. So Petrovich argues that what they're talking about in Genesis 10 is just Sargon of Akkad. And that would also fit with an early Bronze Age time period, not a later Iron Age time period. This is how he translated it. Uh, I won't spend too much on this, but you can see he, he plays with the Hebrew words a little bit and points out that some of these could mean other things. And it doesn't really mean hunter. could also mean these other city names. So it's an interesting perspective he takes on it. You can see his paper if you want to study that more in depth. So let's move on to the Tower of Babel. This is, of course, one of the biggest things people – where was the Tower of Babel? It, there's problems that we need to go over first. Now – this is just a text from Genesis 10. talks about it. The whole earth had one language. probably means land because uh, it talks about people setting in the land of Shinar. It probably refers to that region. Now, one thing we got to note is that most people think it talks about the city of Babylon. The problem is, is that Babylon didn't become a major city until about the time of Abraham. So, the idea, so this is a big problem for the Tower of Babel because how could it be? Babylon, if Babylon did not come in existence until when Abraham was around, and talks about it existing before Abraham sometime in the past. However, the city of Eridu was often identified with Babylon. They both had the same toponym. Eridu Genesis implies Eridu and Babylon were thought of as the same city. Barosus in the 4th century refers to Eridu as Babylon. Uh, A.R. George lists several texts where the cities are equated. So, what happens is, is when Eridu was abandoned, the, the traditions of Eridu were then later became the traditions of Babylon. So Eridu was sort of seen as the old Babylon, and Babylon was sort of seen as like the new Eridu in that kind of sense. So Eridu was basically a thriving city from this, these time periods. It was intermediately abandoned a lot. I'll get to that in a second, though. But first, let's talk about some correlations in the text. Okay, Eridu is referred to as a Babylon, having the same toponym. Genesis says it was a city of Babel. Built after a migration. So this is when the proto-Sumerians are moving in. And Genesis 11 might hint to that about people moving to the land of Shinar. They sort of happen when the proto-Sumerians are sort of moving in. Urbanization starts to peak, and this is around the Uruk period. Uh, Eridu has a ziggurat made of fired bricks. That's what Genesis 3 also mentions. Or, sorry, Genesis 11 verse 3 mentions. And then Akkadian and Sumerian texts, there's similar language about ziggurats what we see in Genesis 11. So they talk about their ziggurats having, having its tops in the heavens. Well, Genesis 11, 4 uses the same language. And it's meant to bring the gods down. Ziggurats were not like 
where they weren't used for ceremonies as far as we can tell. They seem to be stairways, so the gods can come down from the heavens and walk down easily down the steps to the temple, right by the ziggurat. Well, Genesis 11.5 sort of plays on that and mentioned God, you know, God coming down to see the city. And instead of him being delighted, he's, of course, disgusted by it. So it's sort of like, you know, more cultural, cultic or cultural competition there in that kind of sense. Now, getting to the specifics of Eridu, this is a rough estimate. It's no by we're defi- definitive, but Eridu was intermediately abandoned several times. Uh, it's possibly abandoned during the, the end of the Ubaid period. There was a big abandonment, though, at the end of the Uruk period, though. That's the most important abandonment. This was a so. This happened around 3400 BC. In the following periods, the Gem the Gemdet Nisar and the Akkadian periods reveal little evidence of occupation of the city of Eridu after this point. So Eridu was a thriving city in the Uruk period, and then it's suddenly abandoned. And then after that point, people kind of come back, but it never gets back to its former glory. So this took me a while to track down this source last summer, but I was glad I found it. Uh, uh, Henry Wright, who did a survey, says it's unfortunate that the Gemnet Nassar and early dynastic three complexes are indicated primarily by the absence of things, for it is difficult to establish their presence unless they form the dominant complex on the site. So he notes that, you know, in the Uruk period, we have a lot of evidence of occupation there. And then after that, not a lot. Uh, Fouad Safar agrees. He says the si- this was a situation at Eridu during the first half of the Uruk period, which appears to have been brought to a conclusion by no less than an, than an event than the total abandonment of the site. So the site was totally abandoned in the middle of the Uruk period. For some reason, it could be dust storms, famine, they're not sure. Now, what he does note and this is in the second quote I have up here, is that they did come back and they started to use the cultic site a little bit more, like the temple. However, the city never re- it never really became a full-fledged city again. It seems it just be- become a cultic site after that. But that's what Genesis 10 says. It says the Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth and they left off building the city. It doesn't say they, le- they, didn't, they never completed the tower. It says they just left off building the city. In fact, the, conc- the, the idea in earlier verses is that they actually completed the tower because it says that God came down to see the tower they had built. And then it says they left off building the city. So they would have completed the tower but abandoned the city. So basically, what Safar notes, Fawad Safar notes, is that Eridu contained a large ziggurat, con- uh, construct- large ziggurat constructed in the Uruk period called Temple 1 and Temple 2, which Safar says dates to the later Uruk period says that it was temporarily the city was fully abandoned in the Uruk period. Shortly later, an, a northern settlement came back and started utilizing the temple again. But they didn't really use the city anymore for some odd reason. It probably wasn't habitable growing land at that point. So the temple was continued to use after that for a while until its, its final abandonment fan, final abandonment in the later, you know, Babylonian neo-Babylonian period. But it never was a full-fledged city again, which is very kind of interesting there. It was basically just a small cultic site and with minimal residence. So that's my – as for the uh, uh, external evidence. So you have Eden, Flood, Nimrod, and then the Tower of Babel probably correlates with the abandonment of the city of Eridu. Now, some people say, well, you know, it was – if Genesis was around during the monarchy and whatnot, uh, shouldn't other authors have mentioned it? And they, they do. I mean – uh, but they don't do it explicitly like you get in the later New Testament, probably because it was a little bit of a different culture. So let's get to some of these references. So Jeremiah 4, this is one of my favorite ones to cite, as some of my followers will know. Jeremiah 4 has strong correlations to Genesis 1. It says that he, – now what he's doing in Jeremiah 4 is he's talking about the northern kingdom of Israel. And he's saying what happened to them. And he's saying, listen, Judah, if you don't shape up, the same thing's going to happen to you. And to do so, he heavily borrows from Genesis 1. He says that northern Israel is now for, formless and void. There is no light. There, are no, there is no man. There are no birds of the air. And there's no vegetation. So he seems to have clear references, or at least the idea of what's already spoken about Genesis 1. The fall of Lucifer in Genesis 3 seems to be mentioned in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. The fall of Adam seems to be mentioned in Job 15 and Isaiah 6 as well. Uh, Job 15 reference, I'm going off Trigvay Medinger's translation there. 
uh, if you read it in some of yours, they, they try to translate a little differently. But he probably says, did you not gara, grab wisdom for yourself like the first man who did? Uh, divine knowledge is hinted at in First Kings 3. There seems to be some sort of play there. Uh, it's a possible illusion in that sense. Uh, themes from Genesis 2, uh, for example, the tree of life uh, in the tabernacle. When they were making the tabernacle in Exodus, they made it after the Garden of Eden. So the lamppost is based on the tree of life. By allusion in Psalm 19, the tree of knowledge of, e of good and evil is correlating to the law of God. Uh, sin in the garden meant exile. Sin under the Mosaic covenant meant exile. So and this again, this is all coming from Kenneth Kitchen. He highlights a lot of these correlations. He also highlights there's a divine test of obedience in Deuteronomy 8, which is correlating to what we see in the Garden Covenant. Isaiah 24 might reference the flood account. So there's very similar language in the grammatical structure to what we see in Isaiah 24 that seems to parallel what we see in Genesis 7. And Genesis 7 is assumed to be late priestly material in that sense. There might also be a reference to Job, but that's a little less... It's not, it's not as well as the one we see in Isaiah 24 here. Now, liberal scholars are aware of many of these references. Menninger spends a lot of time talking about Ezekiel 28 and the Job 15 passage I cited. And what they say is there was a lost Adamic source that Ezekiel and Job relied on because Genesis didn't exist yet in its form. Now, I argue that's not parsimonious, and here's my reasoning. You have to say there's some unknown pre-Adamic myth some unknown Genesis myths that inspired Deuteronomy, Jeremiah, Job, Exodus, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea. Then they, the author of Genesis borrowed the same language to put all that together, as well as drawing on the pre-Adamic myth, obviously. Wouldn't it make more sense to say there was just an early form of Genesis that was referenced by these authors? Now, this doesn't mean you have to have Genesis in its final form. I mean, there, they could have updated certain things. Like I think there was a clear uh, reference... And I believe it's in Genesis 11 or 12 where it says Ur of the Chaldeans. Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans. I think they're just updating it to mention the Chaldeans, which was a later group that would not have existed during the time of Abraham. They're just saying Abraham left this city, you know, where the Chaldeans currently are living kind of attitude. So you don't have to have its final form, but there had to be at least some early form that would have been very much what we have now in that kind of sense. So – Let's move on to the last thing, internal consistency. Now, I bring this up. The documentary hypothesis is not accepted by every scholar, but a lot of scholars still hold to it. It's kind of falling out of favor. It goes back and forth. I don't really know. The original documentary hypothesis was this idea that the Pentateuch was composed of four sources. You had Deuteronomy. You had the J source. These are the Yahweh passages. Anytime you see a passage that talks about Yahweh, that comes from the J source. And sometimes you see in the, in the Pentateuch, they don't – Say Yahweh, they say Elohim. Well, that comes from a different source, the E source. Then you have priestly material that's inserted in as well, and that you get the Pentateuch. This was the general idea of what you get with the documentary hypothesis. And it's this idea that there was four sources that were sort of put together to make the final form of Genesis. And so the final form of Genesis didn't come about until exile. There's a lot more complicated forms. As I said, you know, there's a lot of debate on this. I could quote from Richard Hess's book here, for, for example. Um, he says that uh, Yizekiel Kaufman argues for a pre-exilic P in the middle of the 8th century. Whereas other scholars doubt this, Zevet argues it could date to the late 10th century. Wenham places P before J. Uh, Red Torf and Wenham identified J and E as originally one document. Van Cedars has argued for a later date for J, while Birds de de defends an earlier monar mon monarchy date. Bloom argues for the union of two compositions, a D composition. This is a later and influenced by an earlier D, and a P composition. He, he, he keeps going on. He goes on for like another like half a page, but argues there's so many different documentary hypotheses. It's a, almost a little comical. No one can agree on what the original sources for the Pentateuch were. It's thrown all over the place. Additionally, skeptics will again argue, as I mentioned this earlier, that Genesis was copied or borrowed, borrowed from pagan creation myth tales. Now, Gordon went home. Gordon went and notes this, and he says it doesn't make sense. He says you, you got to pick one. Either Genesis was put together by earlier sources, or the author was borrowed from pagan myths. You, you can't do both. So to quote from him directly, he says it is strange that the two accounts of the flood, so different as J and P, circulating in, in ancient Israel, 
should have been combined to give our present story, which has many more resemblance to the Gilgamesh version than the postulated sources. In other words, they'll say the flood account that we have in Genesis is really a combination of J and P sources. But separate, they don't match Genesis, or they don't match Gilgamesh. Combined, however, they just magically line up to form what we see and you know, the, the make the parallels that we see with Gilgamesh's flood account. Why is it that the early sources don't match up, but somehow they're put together and they match up perfectly with Gilgamesh? So you got to pick one. Either they were plagiarizing pagan myths, or they were put together from these early sources. Now, Com Richard Hess also notes that computer analysis of spelling patterns in the Pentateuch is shown there is consistent style of spelling. This is, of course, if you remove the vowels. Uh, the Pentateuch um, perseveres. An uh, excuse me. The Pentateuch preserves anomalous grammatical features that occur across the sources di uh, divides, but are found much less frequently in the other parts of the Hebrew Bible. So basically, what you know he's noting here is that there's a lot of consistency in what we see in the Pentateuch. Uh, now, again, I don't think it was all put together at one time necessarily. But it does seem to suggest that it, it, there is some sort of internal consistency going on that does reflect an early time period. So Genesis 1 and 2, Hess also notes, matches how early Sumerian accounts were sort of put together in their literary structure. And he mentions one the Enki and Ninma. Now, internal consistency within Genesis 11 is actually, between Genesis 1 and 11, is actually quite high. So you can see the three birth announcements of Genesis 4 have similar language. The same Hebrew construction occurs for occupations in Genesis 4. Adam and, Cain, Adam and Cain have the same occupations. Their sins are both connected to fruit. Uh, they're both questioned the same way. They're both sentenced the same way. And they're both punished the same way. Again, same grammatic structures are flowing from Genesis 3 to Genesis 4. There's internal consistency with the use of seven. We see a lot of sevens building up. And if you divide the sources, you don't get this. So if you notice, go to the last point here. Com um, there are, 70 there are 70 times God is mentioned, either as Yahweh or Elohim, and accumulates in Genesis 4.26 with people calling on the name of the Lord. Now, if you go to Genesis 2.4, there's 35 times you see the name Yahweh. Between Genesis 2.1 and Genesis 2.4, the, word, the, the uh, word for Elohim shows up 35 times. You, this is something – is, someone is work, doing this on purpose. You don't just – this doesn't just come together by collecting J and P sources and E sources. It just – this is not what you would get with that kind of thing. Uh, there's poetic alterations as well. And Abel became a keeper of the flocks, and Cain became a keeper of soil. You know, there's sort of these poetic sort of building ideas on it. There's chiastic patterns from Genesis 2 up to Genesis 3. Another chiastic pattern starts in Genesis 4. A big chiastic pattern is formed in the flood account. Seems very unlikely they were sort of combining these things to put them together in that sense. There's lexical and linguistic similarities. Genesis 3, 9 pairs with 4, 13 with 10. Get the idea. It seems very much like this is sort of the, a, an internal consistent work in that sense. Story flow also works well. Oh, in the same way it matches after has, as, as I mentioned earlier. God establishes man, fall of man, fall of family, fall of civilization, destruction. God establishes a new Adam, fall of man, fall of family, fall of civilization, destruction. God establishes a new Adam again. Same kind of structure there. So let's piece everything I put together here, and then we'll go to questions. Internally, it reflects an old time period. Externally, it matches early events. Later biblical authors seem to be aware of Genesis. So they seem to have this idea that it, it was already in existence around their time period, and then it's internally consistent. So that seems so if it's internally consistent and authors know about it, and it's internally and externally reflects an older time period. That would place Genesis further back than Babylonian exile, obviously. It would not be plagiarized from pagan myths. They would have their own history they were putting together. It would not be put together by these J, P, D, and E sources, which I think is way too simplifying the complexity of the, of the text. So if it's internally consistent, biblical authors know about it, it internally and externally reflects an order time period, that places Genesis much further back than what we see in like the Persian or the Babylonian time period. And I'll conclude. Thank you. Nice. Oh, I think, uh, okay. Yeah, I had uh, my microphone muted for a second, but yeah, um, that, that was a lot of information. And, and the reason why I didn't like stop IP at all throughout the whole thing is because I, I just wanted to get it out there. 
And what you can do is if you weren't following or if it was just too much information, you can listen to this video again and again and again if you need to and if you want to, obviously, if you're interested in this kind of stuff. So uh, so yeah, I just wanted to, to let him just kind of lay it all out there. And then let's turn to some questions. We already had some pop up here. So the first one is from T Fear Fortune. Let me go ahead and put this on the screen here and take my... All right, so this one is, what do you think about the alternative theory that talks about a lost, advanced global civilization that was destroyed around 11,000 years ago? Oh, yeah, the, the Graham Hancock theory. I'm not convinced of that. Now, to be fair, Graham Hancock is taken out of context a lot of places. He's not arguing that it was like, you know, space age or like they had flying machines in that sense. He's sort of arguing maybe there was like a early like Sumerian group perhaps in that sense they had cultivated animals iron weapons kind of thing and that was lost i'm not convinced of that i don't think his data is well established enough who knows but it, it, it's it's not reflected in genesis so it would be independent of all this to begin with okay let's go to another question from gurgly Nag naggy <laughs> interesting okay he says he or she uh, i think it's a he hello all i would like to ask michael that what is his research method? What is your research method? For example, how, how he, did he make his video on the biases of atheists and how much time did it take? So I try to keep track of everything I'm researching. And one of the things I do is like when I go through like a book, so you can see I have highlights throughout the book. I constantly do that. And then I'll go back and I'll check. Actually, I actually didn't see any highlights. Later. Well, it's kind of hard. It's still yellow either. highlights. I don't know if you can see them or not. but uh, ba I... Barely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, they're I see. there. It's hard to see. I also go through highlighters kind of fast, so I'm like sometimes I'll use like a really old highlighter, and I can I have to go back and redo my highlights. But I highlight stuff. I I have an Adobe Acrobat like cloud, and I put a lot of papers and books in there, and it's all there for easy reference and that kind of stuff. I'll make outlines and notes. So a lot of the stuff you see here is like these notes I have saved that I just put in the slides. I'm gonna do a video later on Abraham. I have a lot of notes on that I'll be doing. So I take notes research my video on AC is bias I came across some studies over the course of a couple years I just made a mental note and then finally when I thought I had enough I put it in a video so it just took a while it takes a while just keep your eyes open keep reading don't ever stop reading it's basically my my advice what about the same question for the presentation you just gave just now yeah same idea a lot of highlights in books um, I read like you know book like Israeli religions Kenneth Kitchens on the reliability of the Old Testament I studied the inscriptions before the flood and sometimes I'll come across a source and like commentary, like I read Kenneth Matthews commentary and I'm like, that's interesting. Let me track this source down. So I did some of that. Uh, you know, it's like, just check, check what you're reading, highlight, take notes, track sources down, save it all in that kind of sense. And as you can see the slides, I gave this presentation about a year ago on apologetics Academy. And, it's, and if, if you watch the old one versus this new one, you'll see, I updated with a lot of information. It's just keeping track of what you have and keep adding to it. Cool. So the, the next question is from David LaRosa. He says, in my opinion, Moses' influence can be read throughout the Torah. For example, the serpent, Pharaoh's heavy heart. In Egyptian mythology, the heart was weighed against the feather of truth. What is your opinion? Great show. Yeah, he's, at, he's right. And there's also other Egyptian parallels as well, I think, in Exodus 15. Uh, I think it's Exodus 15. I could be wrong, but it's about uh, Yahweh leading the people out with like a strong hand. It's, there are some parallels there as well. Uh, there's a great book called Israel in Egypt by James Hoffmeyer, and he goes over a lot of the internal consistencies with Exodus and how it really pairs to Egyptian themes. They, they understood Egyptian seasons and cultivation practices, and they knew a lot for them to just have made this up in the Babylonian exile. So we look, it looks like we have some trolls in the live chat. This one is from Sis Progman Ad Hoc. He says, wow, this is really complex, convoluted stuff from IP You'd have thought if God wanted to make himself known, he would clearly expose himself to all. Yeah, yeah. God does not want you to study, learn, or develop, or mature at all. He just wants to treat you like a, a toddler in a playpen and just give you all the information and zap it into your head. Just be a robot. I mean, he doesn't want you to be a free creature that has to learn and mature. In fact, we should do that with, with teachers should do that in school. Instead of having to have the kids learn math, did you just, just give them all the answers? I mean, why would, you, why would the teacher not just give them all the answers if they didn't care about the kids? Good point. Okay, uh, moving on. Maverick Christian says, thank you for your super chat, Maverick. He says, what is your best theory about why mainstream scholarship rejects 
the early origins of Genesis? Uh, there are there are numerous reasons depending on who you're going to read. Well, there's a big reason that comes up, and this is why I did a three part series on monotheism. It's like two hours long on my channel. Genesis talks about Adam being a monotheist or monotheistic. I should use that term instead. Uh, that Noah was a monotheist in that sense. And they'll argue that monotheism was a late development. It didn't come about until Babylonian exile. So Genesis has to be anachronistic because all the ancient people were polytheistic. They cannot really reflect their real history there because they had because everyone we know in the ancient world was polytheistic. So they assume that. And I see a lot of that happening in the books I've read. Um, so like from Simon Parker to Thomas Taylor or Van Cedars. <laughs> Richard Hess does not like Van Cedars. He, he always is like, going after Van Cedar's work and does a really good job with it. But um, I think that's one of the biggest things they assume is that, well, the monotheists had to come later, therefore their stuff has to be anachronistic. And if you want more, see my three-part series on monotheism on my channel. All right, here is a, uh, another question from Russell Jones. He's, or not, not a question, this is more of a comment. He says, now I know what I didn't know I didn't know. Awesome as always. <laughs> Good, glad I could help. <laughs> All right, uh, here's another super chat from Tanner Terry. Thank you. He says, come on, computer load. All right, IP, do you ground God in your reason or your reason in God? If it is the latter, then your apologetic method seems inconsistent with your conclusion. It reminds me of Wittgenstein's ladder in a way. Do you ground God in your reason or your reason in God? I mean, this is not well defined. Are we talking about epistemically, metaphysically, uh, what are we talking about here? That that can mean so many different things depending on what field of philosophy we're in. Yeah, it's not really clear to me what the question is supposed to be. It's a presuppositional argument, I feel like, and I, I thoroughly reject presuppositionalism. So, Yeah, I think that there's a difference between having God as the metaphysical foundation for logic and reason and everything. There's a difference between that and then having God as the epistemological foundation. Right. And I would not say he has to be the epistemological foundation, but you could argue the metaphysical reason. I mean, I am a scholastic realist in that sense. Well, you could also accept both of those, but then argue that you don't necessarily have to presuppose that God exists in order to give someone an argument that God exists. Yeah, so even if he was the epistemological ground. And, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, Maxwell Yates says, well, if Genesis is really oh history... God. Yep. And God created everything, then who created God? Boom, roasted. Yeah. Yo, you got me, Maxwell. You. So this is a Poe account, by the way. Yeah, well, do you want to give a response to that for people who don't know, maybe if, are just hearing that for the first time? How do you respond yeah. to the who created God? Well, no one says that... <laughs> well, you have a video that's titled... Yeah, I got a... You have, it's the like the worst... objection to theism. Yeah, it's the worst objection to, to theism. Uh, who created God? No one says that everything has to have a creator. Only things that begin to exist or contingent things have to have a creator. So God is outside of time. He was just simply always is. All right. So here's a, a question from Pedro Jr. He says, why does IP takes man's word over God's word? These trolls, man. They, they <laughs> think they're funny. This is getting old now. This goes back to my debate with G-Man on Genesis 5. And since then, people have been just saying that to me because that's what I was accused of. So it's become a running joke now. Goodness. Okay, well, I'm waiting for more questions to come in. So, okay, uh, this one, th this guy's been asking me this like in every single super chat. Or not, not super chat, but in like every comment. Okay, let me see if I can pull it up here. From Zhao Victor. Yao Victor. Ask IP about the documentary hypothesis, which we already talked about, the relation between the sources, and if he had some evidence for mosaic authorship. Bring it. Bring it. Well, I did give a little bit in the presentation, like Genesis 10 would correlate uh, well with that time period. Um, there was, so my, I did a video, my, my three-part series on monotheism is sort of like an indirect reply to evidence, uh, specifically the first video, which is titled Polytheism in the Bible. Uh, and then the, my, my favorite is the second one, Israel's Revolutionary Monotheism. And then everyone really likes the third one, The Case for Ancient Monotheism. So uh, that would be my, my, my response to evidence on that. Um, in response to the documentary hypothesis, I would argue for internal consistency in an early date as well. Combined, you can't do one without the other. In terms of mosaic authorship, um, 
I've not looked that much into that yet. That's some. That's going to be another research topic coming up. Uh, one of the things I know that Kenneth Kitchen and Hoffmeyer do advocate a lot for. Uh, one of the things you have to look at, though, is that if you have a bunch of slaves coming out of Egypt, how are you going to get all this codified law and this understanding of the the complexities of the different ancient Near Eastern laws and incorporate them? Well, it makes sense. You could have an educated person from the Egyptian court leading them that would be able to direct them in that kind of sense. So you have an indirect argument from Moses. Uh, we don't have any external attestation to Moses, obviously, because, you know, for the same reason we don't have any attestation for, like, Cain or Abel. I mean, it's just an old nomadic person or a person who would not have been a king of, like, some major great city. So, I mean, in terms of specifically for Mosaic authorship, I mean, it wouldn't really be... I mean, you would. I, you also have to think. I don't actually think Moses had to write every word of the Pentateuch. I think this was put together with the help of the elders of Israel. I think, for example, Deuteronomy four reflects something that happened after the conquest and was sort of put in there. Check out a video I did called "Writing Scripture: Cultural Context of the Biblical World." I did it back in April, and it explains that a little bit more in detail. What do you make of the idea that Moses was myth? Was like a mythical person? And uh, someone in the live chat, same, the same guy that was, I think he was trolling earlier, was saying that he's based on someone who, who was around 500 years prior, prior to his existence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they'll say Sargon. And Hoffmeyer responds to this in his book on Israel and Egypt, and he says, like, look, it, it seems to be a cultural theme of you, you send babies down the river in baskets. I mean, it's also similar to the Romulus and Remus account, because they leave a baby by the river, leave the babies by the river. So he responds to this and says, you know, this is no different than the fact that we hear about babies being left on doorsteps. It doesn't mean they're all plagiarizing each other. It just as a cultural theme that seems to happen. Just because Moses was put in a reed basket and sent down a river, and so was Sargon, that doesn't mean one copied the other. It could very well be that that was just the easiest way to get, you know, kids away from being killed. Uh, you know, send them down a river and hope something, a rich royal person helps them in that sense. So Hoffmeyer goes into this in more detail in his book. Um, if and again, it, it seems like we're picking too much on these minute parallels and running wild with them and ignoring the exorbitant amount of details. That same thing when you get when you compare Genesis to Gilgamesh. It's, let's ignore a lot of the uh, the differences and focus too much on the minor similarities. All right, this is a question from Orthy Caro, and this is well. They ask, "Can I ask capturing Christianity what the banging music at the beginning was?" And by banging, I'm thinking he's he's thinking that it's like, it's good music. So uh, if you're watching this in the future, you probably didn't hear it because I actually edit out the very beginning music that we have is for the countdown. But I got it off of a website called Soundstripe. And so there you go. It's not like a, a song that I got or that I was listening to on the radio or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's a song that I found. And you use that website for that specific purpose to find music for projects that you have. So Soundstripe is where I got that from. All right. From Kevin McElroy, he says, Cameron's hair and Michael's beard, God confirmed. I tried to gel my beard, like to get it out of because I keep getting it stuck in my mouth or whatnot. And I can't, this is too wild. I put wax and oil, nothing. And if I put too much in it, it just looks like I'm from the twenties. Yeah. You probably just need to cut it off. No, no, my wife won't let me. Really? She likes it? Yeah, oh, she got... So, I, someone actually... I was going to be in someone's wedding, and as a groomsman, they said, I got to cut my beard, and my wife was like, nope. She wouldn't <laughs> let me do it. When she told them no. She told the bride no, and I did wow. not cut it. Well, I mean, at least like a little trim, like make... I don't know. I, I trimmed it up, but I'm trying to grow this part oh, okay. out. I'm going to keep this trimmed. Hmm. All right, uh, let's move away from facial hair. Harley Weiss asks, what do you think of Reformed epistemology? This is a little bit off topic, but I, I'm a fan of Reformed epistemology if it's phrased in the right way, if, if you understand right. it correctly, uh, which for anyone who doesn't know what Reformed epistemology is, the basic idea is that belief in God, some, some people say belief in Christianity in particular, but more generally belief in God can be rational apart from any kind of argument. So even if you don't have an argument for God's existence, you can still have a rational belief in God's existence. So here's here's an, an analogy or an example of other beliefs that we have that we don't, most of us don't have arguments for these beliefs. So my children, my daughter just turned five and my son is two and a half. Uh, 
So I think that they ha- are conscious and they have minds of their own. They're not just like robots. So, or not not robots, but I think that they are persons. They have minds. But I didn't come to that belief on the basis of some kind of argument. I didn't like put together a list of premises and like create a deductive argument and they'd be like, oh yeah, th- so the evidence supports these premises and a conclusion follows necessarily because follows the deductive form of modus ponens and so therefore I believe that the that my kids have minds. I, I didn't go through any kind of process like, like that at all. I just find myself having that belief based on my interactions with them. So a, a famous guy, a famous philosopher named Chris, uh, Alvin Plantinga basically made the same kind of argument from other minds to God. So in the same way that we form beliefs about people having minds, just interacting with them, he argues that we can have the same kind of belief, rational belief about God's existence based on our experience. A lot of people have religious experiences. And so as long as it's grounded in something that we believe or experience, then it's a rational thing to hold, even if you don't necessarily have arguments for your position. So that's that's just a roundabout way of describing it. And, and there's a lot more that can be said about this. That's just a very, very rough overview. And there, there are people who uh, who disagree with that thesis. But I think that most epistemologists, most like professionals working in this field in, in epistemology, actually agree with the way that I phrased it. So belief in God can be rational apart from arguments. I think it's, it's actually going to be a minority of people, a, a, minor, a minority of epistemologists who are going to want to deny that. And there's a bunch of reasons why that's true as well. But do you have any... I, I, that's something I could talk about all day. Did you want to say anything on that before we move on? No, you said everything I'd want to say. Okay, cool. Yeah, and we have a, a few more super chats come in as I was talking. So let's try to get through these and then we'll close it out. From Gina M. How do you understand theologically humanity to have fallen with Adam and Eve? Correct me if I'm wrong, but there is some evidence that killing, etc., happened prior to the time period you mentioned for the existence of Eden. Yeah, so it, uh, I'll give a brief overview, but if you want to see more, see my series on Genesis 1-11. to I'll have another video on that coming on next, this month. Uh, but basically, uh, we understand the fall. Uh, I don't think it reflects the introduction of physical death for the first time. Uh, when Paul talks about it in Romans 5, it's very clear if you read the context, it's about spiritual death. This is when humanity spiritually died. Because he contrasts life in Christ with death and sin. Okay, well... We don't become physically alive in Christ. We become spiritually alive. Uh, there's also so there's some interesting correlations there. Also, Genesis 1.28 seems to already imply that humans have a right to kill animals based on the Hebrew words for subdue and have dominion. Uh, so I don't think it introduces physical death. Uh, I would say that humans were mortal when they were in the garden, and this is reflected in Genesis 3.22 because God doesn't change their bodies. He just says, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Cut him off from the tree of life, lest he you know, take from it and live forever. Okay, the implication is that humans were only allowed to be immortal by eating from the tree of life, not that they were already immortal. So they were granted immortality by having continual access to this special tree, and they broke the covenant. They lost that, and so they just died from the natural processes normally. And so they spiritually died. They were exiled from the co- from the garden, lost the covenant in that sense. So. Uh, if you want to see my more see my Genesis series, I go into chapter by chapter in there and explain every detail. So Othi, man, I he says I butchered my name or his name, How old? but he says thanks for for answering. No problem, Othi Caro. I know I'm I probably just butchered it again. Sorry, buddy. All right, Patrick. It's clearly he, pronounced Harold. <laughs> Patrick Mo- Mosher. I'm not. I, I'm. I'm awful with names. Just gotta get over it. All right. He says, "Did you come across any apostolic fathers or patristic era writers in your research about the date of the writing of Genesis?" Nothing came out for me when I was when I've read ap- apostolic fathers. Uh, they're they're more theologically inclined in a lot of ways. They're trying to defend against Gnostic arguments, um, and I'm trying to talk about more from our cultural perspective on how we know this is reliable and would go back to the Bronze Age. So nothing really came up with regards that would ring any bells for that. All right, let's get through some more of these uh, these Super Chats real, real quick. So Ian says, debate Jay Dyer or Eli uh, uh, Ayala. Ayala? How do you pronounce his last name, Ayala? 
so I don't, I don't have much. I, I think I may have conversed with Eli maybe once or twice, but Jay Dyer mm-hmm. and and uh, IP were actually slated to come on to my my YouTube program here, and a lot of stuff happened. You can see the discussion that's actually posted on IP's Facebook page, the discussion that happened, and and based on that dialogue that we had. In, uh, it was like a, a, a messenger thing back and forth. We we decided, or I decided, that I'll, I'm not going to have Jay Dyer on my channel. So, and you can yeah, you can see why. He blocked me on Twitter, so I can't even talk to him anyway. Yeah, yeah. People just need to stop asking. Uh, I, yeah. I don't know how how profitable it would be in any case. Okay, from Tanner Terry. I think this is a clarification from a super chat he sent in earlier. He says, "If God is necessary for you to make sense of what reason is." and its viability as a tool, then it seems to follow that God is necessary for you to make sense of what knowledge is and how you know it. This, so I mean, I this to me just it is so off topic. It is very off topic. I and mean, I don't think God is necessary for you to make sense of what reason is. Uh, I don't, I mean, I think atheists can make, epistemically, or in epistemology can make sense of reason without reference to god I, I don't i think that's just innate in our human capabilities that you could argue god has given us in a metaphysical sense but that's separate from the epistemic foundation this is why i don't use arguments for god's existence from epistemology i don't think they work based on the same right, principles i just said yeah let's move on from from that uh from sentinel apologetics what is mike's view on the nephilim love you oh sentinel apologetics knows full well uh, and he, he he's helped with some of my flood research, by the way. So check out his channel. He's got a lot of good stuff on the flood. Uh, he knows full well I do not think the Nephilim were fallen angels. I have a 36-minute video on my channel, Genesis 6a, the, the, the Nephilim. And I argue Meredith Klein's view, and as well as Alan Miller also takes this view, I found out. Uh, they advocate the idea that what is going on in Genesis 2 is more of what we see in the early Akkadian sources, that sons of... Kings were referred to as sons of God. And so what happens is the kings become polygamous, and they produce offspring that create violence, and so God, of course, sends the flood because there's a rampant sin. There's polygamy, abuse of women, there is endless violence. All this thing sort of accumulates in the flood. And I think that's more reflected internally, but if you want to see more, see the 36 video I have on my channel, which goes into more detail. But no, I'm not convinced that fallen angels ever had, became physical and had inner relations with women. I don't find any support for that in the biblical text. Okay, from Anders Ekren, he says, Mike, I love your content. Congrats with your Thank university you. acceptance. What's your expectations right. for the years coming in regard to your degree? Uh, well, channel comes first. I'm going to keep making videos. That, to me, is primary because, uh, you know, I wouldn't be going to school if it wasn't for the ch- help from my Patreon supporters and everything. Uh, so expectations for the coming year i'm going to finish my genesis series i have a five-part series on evidence in neuroscience against materialism coming out starting first video will be out next week so i'll go over a lot of evidence in neuroscience and biology that the mind does not reduce to the brain that consciousness is fundamental and cannot reduce to material aspects the first one will be on neuroscience the second will be on the hard problem third one will be on uh, objections from materialists like split brain persons split brain examples then i'll do one on quantum biology and then one on a um, near-death experiences it'll be an updated series i did years ago i'll be doing more evidence on our biblical archaeology as well as finishing the genesis series i'm going to do a video on enoch the book of enoch this year and explain why it shouldn't be in the bible uh i have a very important video coming out in december called the lost messages of the bible and then i'm gonna do some and then 2021 archaeology from abraham up to the exodus is my goal Oh my gosh, we're still we're we're getting in like a million super chats. So we'll we'll just get through as many as we can. Do you have do you have a lot of time? I, I got time. I got another half hour. You got as much time as you need. Okay, uh, Athi Caro, I think that's how he, he's he followed up again. He says you got my first name right that time. Surname says Marrow, but swap the M for C. Also with my spare letters, I love your work, Mike. Listen, so Harold, hopefully thank. You. Listen, Harold, thank you. I'm glad you love my work, but it's easier on us if you just go by Harold. Can we just go by Harold? I'm kidding. Athi Karoi. I'm going gonna, I'm I'm gonna to butcher it again before I move on. Maybe you'll send in another super chat. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, so the, the unapologetic apologist says, just wanted to say I appreciate you both. 
I appreciate you. Thanks. Appreciate it, man. I yeah. just had an interview uploaded to his channel, by the way. So it's on Idealism. If you want to check that out, he, it's on his channel. We did it last week. He just uploaded it today. Yeah, and I did one with him as well on the argument from contingency. That's on his, his channel as well. Sentinel Apologetics. He says, I know Mike. Still love you, though. <laughs> yeah, I know. Him and I disagree on the Nephilim. But it's okay. I'm right. He's wrong. We'll just get past it. Yeah, it's okay. IP's right about everything, so... Uh, Jacob Sparks says, on behalf of all Eastern Orthodox Christians, I would like to apologize for how people like Jay Dyer may have treated you. I enjoy your content. Well, thanks. We appreciate that. And we, we know it does not reflect all of Eastern Orthodox Christians. I, yeah. I, I had Patreon supporters messaging me when that happened saying he, he we're, you know, we, we disown him. Like he was not they, were, they did not want to be associated with him after that. So I fully understand. Yeah, it was a really, really weird situation. So. Again, if you want to see what happened, then just search for it on IP's Facebook page. He posted about it there. But it was we had a debate scheduled, and then it fell through because of that conversation. Uh, so Trinity Radio says, I'm so, so sorry for uh, I was streaming while you were. My bad. I'll try to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Bro, don't worry yeah, about Braxton. it. I mean, it's going to happen. I think the more and more often that we all are doing stuff, it's going to happen. People are going to be streaming at the same time. I don't think it's it's that big of a deal. And especially like most of the people that are watching these videos are going to they're going to be watching them way after the fact. So a lot of cool, really cool people will be watching live, but most people will be watching after the fact. Not to say that people watching after the fact aren't cool. But anyways, I, I, I it's they're not a big deal. They're just rad. They're just rad. They're yeah, people that are watching are cool. People are watching after the fact are rad. Okay, uh, from Gina says, I understand death happening before the fall, but if murder happened prior to the fall, wouldn't that mean sin happened prior? So that's a good question. This is how I get I explain this. So young earth, crea young, <clears throat> excuse me, young earth creationists believe Cain married his sister, but that is clearly outlawed in the Levitical law. Paul talks about this in Romans 5.13, where there is no law, there is no sin. So God has to give humans law for there to be sin. Uh, Jesus sort of hints at this as well in John 9, 41, John 15, 22. You know, humans need to be made aware of the law for there to even be sin. So until God made a covenant with Adam and Eve, the first covenant, introduced the idea of sin, there was no actual sin because there was no law given yet. So that's a clear theme throughout the Bible. There is no sin if there is no law yet. That's why it was okay for Noah to eat bacon, but it was not okay for Moses to eat bacon. Hey, uh, before we get to the next super chat, I want to mention this. Like, if you have appreciated what Mike has said in this this interview today, and you like the work that he's doing, go support him. Like, we Thank need you. people to support us and to continue supporting us in order to keep our channels up and running. It, it, one thing that I noticed after I was I went through a whole fundraising phase, and I'm I'm still in in a fundraising phase, and I had to learn this afterwards. I was thinking like, okay, once I get to the to the place that I need to be. I'll be good. I can just move forward with the work and I can have my group of, of people who are supporting me and we can all just work as a team. And I that was a kind of naive view that I had back then because simply because people will support you and that's great, but there are people who fall away every month. There are people who, who enter a, a really tough financial situation. They lose their jobs. They just can't, for whatever reason, continue supporting you. And so there's fluctuation there. And so you basically have to continue raising support. And so I just want to encourage anyone who is watching, who's gotten something out of Mike's work, you've been thinking, maybe, you know, I, I want to support what he's doing. Now is the time to do it. Like go over to his Patreon. I think it's just patreon.com slash inspiring philosophy. Go support him. And, uh, you know, obviously you can support me as well. But in this stream, I want to, to kind of push push this for him. Is that it, I appreciate we, Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we all need support and we all need to uh, ensure and that this this work continues to, to go, to, to grow. And also, I'll be doing a private live stream for donors and patrons this Sunday. So that's only for donors and patrons, and they can ask me anything, including future research I'm, future research I'm working on and things I keep private. So I'll be covering that this Sunday. Cool. All right, uh, let's get to a couple more of these Super Chats, and then we'll close it out. Daniel Apologetics says, Is Mike a young earth creationist yet? God bless you both, champs. <laughs> I'm almost there. Ken Hovind has almost got me. He just has to make another video arguing from Gail Ripplinger, and I'll be there. Or, like, smashing you with some toy. 
<laughs> yeah. He needs what to, is that about? The hammer a couple more times. <laughs> yeah. That's so that strange. reminds me. I'll be doing a video. I need to do a video this year at some point called the top ten biblical problems for for young Earth creationism. Okay, Authy responded again with another super chat. He says, "Sure, call me Harold, Harold <laughs> Carrowy." <laughs> Good. <laughs> we'll we do. settle. Yeah, glad we, that that's IP is uh, always right. <laughs> Okay, Gospel to the Greek says, if animals like, like say, octopuses develop human-like intelligence, would that make them image of God too? God bless both of your ministries. Help me a lot. I, great question. That's one of the arguments that I and scholars like Michael Heiser used to argue against that interpretation of the Imago Dei, that it's not about intelligence. The Imago get the, uh, Joshua Moritz is a philosopher out of Ber- Berkeley. He's also written a lot on this. Very good on it. The Imago Dei refers more to the election point. It means exactly the same thing it means in the New Testament when it says we are called to conform to the image of his son. To be the image of God is to be elected by God to represent him on earth as his image. So it has nothing to do with intelligence. There's nothing special about you. Uh, there's, it's all about who God has chosen. God has elected humans to be his image. It's about a relational election type aspect. All right, let's get the, this will be the last one for today. Jim Wick says, has IP been following Dr. Craig's interviews on capturing Christianity? What are his thoughts on the mytho-history approach? I have seen some of them. I don't entirely agree with Craig on everything he's arguing for. Um, I Like, especially his understanding of Matthew, Jesus talking about the creation, I think. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with his concerns regarding that, uh, because even when I was a year of creation, I thought that was a bad argument to suggest that Jesus is talking about the creation itself. He's clearly talking about the creation of marriage. Uh, but I don't agree entirely with him. If you want to know my unique perspective, it's um, in my Genesis series, and I'm laying it all out right there. And despite what skeptics say, it's not just plagiarizing John Walton. I've been accused of saying, well, you're just putting out whatever John Walton says. No. <laughs> Should If you're saying that, you clearly have not read John Walton, because I disagree with him on a lot of things, like how Genesis 1-1 should be translated, or how to interpret Genesis 3, 4, and 5. I agree with him a lot on Genesis 2 and some of Genesis 1, but it's I'm really trying to draw from a lot of different scholars to get a better understanding of Genesis. Oh, gosh. We got, we got two more Super Chats right at the very end. Let's see if we can just get uh, at least one of these. From... From Nada Verse, she says, I think it's, yeah, I think it's she. She says, thanks, Mike. I personally know some atheists that have found your inspiring philosophy content compelling enough to, at the very least, consider God in earnest. So thanks for that. I appreciate that. It's great to know. And that helps. That all, I love hearing that kind of stuff because it's always encouraging. It keeps me going. Yeah, that's a great thing to, to end it on. So is there anything that you'd like to say to the audience before we close it out? Uh, no, I'll be doing my uh, private hangout this Sunday. I have another video premiering on my channel next Friday on neuroscientific evidence for the irreducible nature of mind. So if you want any more, just check out my channel. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, so YouTube slash C slash Inspiring Philosophy. I think, is that the the right URL? It's YouTube.com slash Inspiring Philosophy, yeah. Okay, there you go. It's also linked in the description of the video. So, all right, guys. Well, thanks for hanging out. Thanks for watching this video, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.